Hi, and welcome back to the Growing Up in Scientology YouTube channel. We're going to resume part two of the interview with me, Aaron Smith-Levin, and with Mike Rinder. So we're just going to pick it up where we left off. Um, okay, so in the last interview, we covered a lot of ground, and uh, it looks like where we left off was we pretty much told your story right up until the point that you arrived on the flagship Apollo to join the Sea Org, where was L. Ron Hubbard on the ship at that time? Yes. He was. Just, he'd just come back to the ship. He'd been off the ship for a, a uh, almost a year in New York, and had just returned to the to the uh, Apollo. Okay, and then we covered my story up until the point where we had just gone. I had just gone to Flag from Philadelphia to do training as right. a staff member from the Philadelphia Org. The idea was to train up to be an auditor. Okay, all right. So the next question here is: Once you were on staff or in the Sea Org, generally, how did it go? So for you, you explained last time that. You went to uh, the ship, the Apollo, with the intention of doing one specific course of training. And then right. once you got there, you were told that you were transferred to be an actual uh, member of the crew on the, on the flagship Apollo. Right. That was a bit of a surprise for you. Um, so just what happened over the next few years or up until the next major milestone? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Was... Uh, there's a lot of things that happen, Aaron. I mean, when I, like to begin with, I didn't want to be there at all. Okay. I was try plotting and scheming, trying to figure out how was I going to get off and get out. I had become, I had got made a deckhand. I was working, you know, uh, scrubbing rust things on the side of the ship. And I didn't really enjoy myself at all and had a very limited interaction with anybody else on the ship. I was really with the bums that were on the decks, you mm -hmm. know, in the deck division of the Apollo, which was the, you know, it's like the estates right. division of any <clears throat> organization in Scientology. It's the least important. It's where the people get put that they don't know what to do with otherwise. I, I mean, in theory, it was sort of, you know, you're, you're going to prove yourself as a worthy member of the, of the ship's company by doing and starting at the bottom, doing the most menial labor. Right. Um, you so know, let me jump in with a question here. So when you were still thinking that you were going to the ship for the specific uh, training yeah. called the Flag Executive Briefing Course, yeah. how long were you planning on being there? Oh, six months or something. Okay. So then when you get to the ship and you find out your basically now permanent staff there, like was the objection that you are now going to be spending more than the six months that you had planned or was the objection that you didn't like the work that you were doing or did you just not like the idea of being a ship staff member? Um, I guess the objection was primarily that I had not planned on leaving Australia. Hmm. That, that I considered that was my home. That was where my family was. I hadn't. Uh, intended that I was going to really sever ties with my family kind of permanently because mm -hmm. when you like at that time when you're on the Apollo you were you were gone like nobody knew where you were you didn't have any easily accessible uh, access to communication you could write letters but you know they would take forever to get anywhere because you couldn't put them in the mail mm -hmm. because where you were was completely confidential and it wasn't you couldn't send a letter back home from lisbon because nobody was supposed to know you that you're in lisbon so it was a i think that was the primary thing that really bothered me i mean the work didn't that's never but in the in my entire history in the sea org Doing menial labor never bothered me. I just, I could care less. It didn't, it didn't matter to me. I mean, I, I, I've done more weeding and cleaning of the bilges and engine room work on the free winds and uh, pinholing and construction and stuff than you can possibly imagine. And though it was for the most part, meted out as some sort of punishment. To me, it was like, oh, this is a relief. You know, the the lack of stress and the not having to worry about anything and just, you know, hammering nails or raking leaves or whatever, you know. <laughs> I think it's funny because a lot of 
a lot of the media coverage focuses on some of the the menial tasks um, senior senior executives are put onto, or even teenagers are put onto. But the fact is, in the scope of being in the Sea Org, particularly up at the international levels, I think it's fair to say that oftentimes being put onto that work is more of a reprieve from your day to day stressful life. <laughs> it was a, that's absolutely true. Right. It, and but but right from the outset, it never bothered me. The work didn't bother me, and. And ultimately, I came to really enjoy it, and I I met a lot of made a lot of friends with people, and it became like okay, now I have my little group. I wasn't expecting to go there to become a part of that. Right. So when I first was told this is what you're going to do, I was like, well, this isn't what I want to do. But you know, I I don't, I don't know. I guess I kind of got over it, and sure. then started making friends and having people that I would hang out with and people that I like to spend time with. And so I kind of grew into the environment. Right, right. So if you were planning on being there for six months for the study program, right. uh, how long, how quickly after you arrived were you hitting that point of like scheming on, how am I going to get out of here? Oh, the next day. All right, okay. <laughs> I, I wasn't planning on staying. I like, I was writing to people. I was do, like doing everything that I possibly could to change that. And when it became kind of uh, inevitable that it was not going to change. Hmm. Okay. So by the time you sort of grew into it, started making friends and whatnot, you, by that point, you're past, you're past the stage of trying to figure out how to make this not happen. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I get it. And so why were you, I understand the, the idea of working your way up the, organizing charge. Um, but it does seem unusual to be like, yeah, we want this guy. So like, we're going to, you know, do some trade to get him. So he's ours yet. We're going to have him scrub rust. Like, was this in any way, shape or form a punishment? Was it an EPF? Like, was it boot camp for the ship or was it, this is the post that we need filled? It was, uh, I don't really know. I, I mean, it was I think, your real post, though. It wasn't like, yeah, yeah. this is my your boot post, camp. It my was your job. Po my post oh, okay. was deckhand. <laughs> or pinholer. Okay, okay. Uh, that was actually my post on the organizing board, under the first mate in the ship's deck division. Right. You know, like, that was my post. Got it. I, it, was, it was only my post, though, for, I don't know, a few months. I get it, I get it. Uh, maybe six months or something. I can't remember. Okay. And then I went off on a whole weird thing of going to Madeira on a on a. <laughs> it, this is this is an entire story in and of itself. Of where my, is Madeira? Madeira is a Portuguese island in the middle of the Atlantic. Okay. Like very out in, but it's like a it's like a one of the divisions of Portugal is not, it, it's part of the country of Portugal, like a state, like Hawaii. Sure. Uh, but it's very, <laughs> very, very remote. And there was this idea of creating a, a unit there that would do uh, surveys of, it's a big tourist destination, surveys of tourists for the Portuguese government in order to inveigle the Apollo and the shore story of the Apollo, mm -hmm. which was that it was the operation and transport corp. I mean, all this weird, weird stuff to cover up the fact that it had anything to do with Scientology, um, to inveigle itself into the, into the environment and, and get curry favor with the Portuguese government. Okay. And, to give it this air of legitimacy, like it's going to do legitimate work that it can say it's doing for the government, so it doesn't have to say it's doing it exists for science. Right, time. because they were saying that because the mm -hmm. short story was that this was a business management technology company. Oh, okay. Right. On board the Apollo. Oh, that's funny how that story has evolved to present time. <laughs> right. It's also funny that <laughs> if you ever went on board the Apollo, it was about. I mean. There were a lot of great things about it. The camaraderie was wonderful. The 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 friendships that that I built there were fabulous, and it was an absolute, complete, and utter shithole. 
I mean, it was horrible. I, the, there was no, no money was ever spent on creating what were the quote offices. I mean, this was where Scientology was being run from. And it was a bunch of, <laughs> it was a bunch of filing cabinets with, you know, uh, boxes with a piece of wood stacked on top, tied together with rope. And that was someone's desk. And then alongside that was another sort of shanty town thing. And, you know, the whole place was like that, everything about it. And the, and the, you know, the living conditions were insane. I mean, when I first arrived there, I got assigned a bunk in what was called the men's dorm. And the men's dorm was like the black hole of Calcutta because there were people there that, that like everybody was on different shifts. The management people went to bed at 4 a.m. The, the ship people went to bed at 10 p.m. and got up really early. So there was always people sleeping. So it was always dark. Mm -hmm. And there was no air conditioning on the Apollo at all. <laughs> And not only no air conditioning, there's like the deck, the, the bunks were stacked six high. And this is a bulk a ceiling that is like, you know, eight feet. The first bunk that I got assigned was like, when you knew you get the shit. So I had a bunk that I had to get into that was like this high off the ground that I had to climb up and, and slide myself into sideways. And if I wanted to turn over, I had to get out. <laughs> and oh. it stank like terrible oh, man. and there's clothes and there's no closets in there so people hang their clothes on hooks on the end of the bed and as people are shuffling down in the dark trying to get into the bowels of this they knock the clothes off so at the end there was this huge pile of old dirty <laughs> clothes that would just sit there forever oh, because you God. could never find anything because of, I mean it was this was the, the, you know, the management technology company that was going right. to saving the world. And it was, so anyway, now you're going to get me off into never ending I know. stories. There's so many people who want us to, Apollo to do all these stories. But look, the question that we're on is a very general <laughs> question. We could talk about it for hours. Yeah. Which you is haven't said anything when you yet. joined this, which is, <laughs> which is when you joined the Sea Org, how did it go? So right. I think everything so far is very relevant. Now, and I'll answer the question next, but he, let me ask you another question here. So uh, to anyone familiar uh, who, who spent a lot of time on staff or has studied a lot of um, the Scientology management policy, the idea that you sort of um, expand in increments or you, first you put a shitty office there and then you put someone there and then you make them do something productive. And once they get up to a point where they're um, either producing at a high level or where they're they're sort of at least not profitable, but see a lot of functions in Scientology don't generate revenue. Right. But the, the idea that you would make someone prove that they were worthy of giving them a nice or uh, uh, pimping out their office space, that's a common um, concept in Scientology. You don't make something all pretty and then put someone there. You make someone productive and then when it's worth it, you pretty it up. But Until the idea long Well, right, right, right. <laughs> but I'm saying at, at, when, at that time when you're working on the ship, which is the international headquarters of the sea organization and all of Scientology, in your minds, the people who were on the ship, how was it explained away why LRH, who's worth at that time, it's, I don't know if it was tens or hundreds of millions of dollars at that time, but a lot of money, enough to buy a giant freaking ship. How did you guys explain away why everything was bare bones, bare minimum, no money invested in it, no money for food, no money for uniforms? or not? How did you guys think about that? I don't know. I guess it's the same way that, and that's a microcosm of what it's like in in the the Church of Scientology today in Tampa or in Vienna or anywhere in the world. Is that we do not um, think that that money invested in something that you don't have to invest it in like paying stuff. Let's take a quick time out while I make sure we're recording. We're not recording. Okay, but maybe we'll do a mix with the sound that's it's already picking up. <laughs> I hope so. We are, we're just gonna carry on. Okay. <laughs> okay, carry on, My, just carry on. That money invested in things that don't it doesn't have to be invested in, meaning like paying stuff or buying anything good for the you know, 
a typewriter that actually does have, doesn't have missing keys or, uh, you know, a computer that's got more than, you know, one megabyte of memory or those things are not important in the overall scheme of things. What's really important is the dedication of the people, the ability to apply the technology. Like the te in Scientology, the technology trumps everything. <laughs> Even though that technology may keep you antiquated, in the mind, you get into this mindset that this is the answer to everything. And that um, it, it's not affected by whether you have a nice desk or not. It's not affected. And, and a nice desk is probably a bad example because truthfully, a bad desk or a nice desk doesn't make that much difference other than how people perceive you. But there are a lot of things that are stupid, like we don't computerize our filing system because the technology doesn't say to computerize your filing system. So we have huge piles of paper piling up everywhere because that's what the technology of Scientology says. Right. And that technology and the idea that that technology contains the answers to everything explains away virtually everything that you would go whole. Uh, wait a minute, this is, this is nuts. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But it's only nuts because the tech hasn't been applied. Like to solve a problem by spending money that you don't theoretically have because it's all been sent to somewhere else to use rather than solve the problem with the tech is considered to be a, a no-no in Scientology. Right, I mean, right. Scientology staff have, they are indoctrinated into that view and in the Sea Org, it's the same thing. Right. You don't come up with any original ideas for the causes of anything. All the answers are already in the policies. Right. And, and none of those policies say to spend money on anything. Right. They all say don't spend money. Right. So therefore, Getting by with whatever you have is sort of a, I don't know, it's almost like a badge of honor, like right. making do. Right, right. That's true. Because as an individual staff member, when you have to sit down and figure out how to improve um, the conditions of whatever your job is, whatever you're supposed to be dealing with, you're only allowed to evaluate it in terms of, I can only use the resources that are already available at my disposal. You're right. not allowed to sit down and go, what other resources would I need to handle this? You have to go, I have to handle this with my existing resources. How do I do that? Right. And so that never opens up the equation to, I need more money. Correct. Right. So when you're- The, only, the only thing it does is it opens the, I need to make more money. Right. <laughs> when you make it, you don't have the right to spend it. Right, right. You just have the right to make it. <clears throat> so the fact that you guys are on the ship, that's the international headquarters of all of Scientology, um, I don't want to get too far off into the weeds, but is there any awareness of LRH's wealth at that time? You know, because you're there with him. He, he's a real person. Is there any awareness that he's a, an independently wealthy guy? Um, well, his environment was different than everybody else's. Like his birthing. I mean, he whatever. had an office on the promenade deck that was a big office. And uh, he had a, you know, a dining room where he ate with his family and uh, a cabin where he lived. But was it air conditioned? Did he have air conditioning? No. Oh, okay. So that was just a factor of Vince, being on a ship at sea or whatever. An old ship. Yeah. Okay. And it, but it was, it was, um, it was hardly opulent. No, it, I get it. I get it. You, you know, but compared to everybody else, it was. Sure. But in, in, in the overall scheme of things, if you walked into, and you know, Miscavige recreated his office in the, in the new superpower building here right. on the ground floor, when it, when it was going to be the pub, you know, where the public can come in and find out about Scientology. Right. And in doing that, that thing had to be, had to be drastically upgraded from what it really was like. Because it would have been gross. Because it would have been gross. Right, right. Because it would have looked too bad 
to do it exactly as it was, you know, the carpets are tatty, the, 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 the floor is linoleum, the, the desk is, you know, well, yeah, it was terrific compared to cardboard boxes with planks <laughs> on the top, but it's not really, That's funny. you know, and so, and you know, he had a car, uh, nobody else had a car. I mean, he, or he had access to a car, like when there was in Portugal, he had this yellow Pontiac convertible that was kept in, in Portugal and was available for him to use. And Mary Sue had this little red mini, mini estate wagon that was actually kept on the off well deck of the Apollo which ultimately became my car when I was in Madeira, but that's a whole nother story. And Hubbard had a, a, a motorcycle. He had a couple of motorcycles, but then a lot of people had motorcycles on the ship and right, they were right. all stored on the off well deck, but he was the only one that had a Harley, but that Harley was given to him by Toronto walk as a birthday present or something. I don't even right. remember what. Okay, so being on the ship, there wasn't really a sense of um, why do we have to live in such squalor? It wasn't really... No, it was sort of like, like I said, it's kind of like a, this concept of make it go right. We're going to, you know, th this is not, the, the messed universe is not important. There's far more important things. A few hardships because the food sucks or there's no hot water and you have to take a cold shower every day for 30 seconds or whatever. Ah, big deal. That's no, in the overall scheme of things, that's unimportant. And anybody who would make it important would become a pariah. Right. You know, you just wouldn't, you know, it's just this mindset. I don't know how really no, to actually, describe what you're saying, it. it. Makes a lot of sense because I remember obviously when I, uh, you know, I said that I lived at the Hacienda Gardens for three plus years, which is I guess a mile down the street from here. Right. Um, and that was back from '93 to '96, and I'm sure that was paradise compared to the ship, right? But uh, compared to your average apartment building, it was pretty terrible. Uh, but but what you're saying is jogging my memory of it. It the, it's almost like the worse the conditions were the more pride there was in the fact that uh, we're not limited by these materialistic problems. We get our jobs done regardless. We don't let this get in our way. Correct. There was no attention at all on how squalor-like the conditions were. It was almost like we're above that, which is so 180 degrees opposite of today's ideal org strategy in Scientology. We have to buy these $10, $15 million buildings as the explanation because – because we don't have these awesome buildings yet is why people aren't coming into orgs for services. Right. Um, <clears throat> but then when they get the building, still that same mindset still exists. I mean, it, it's, it's the proof that this ideologue strategy thing is, is not anything remotely connected to what it really is. It's just got a PR front attached to it because those orgs, those empty ideologues, they don't pay their electricity bills and they will sit there and freeze in the wintertime and roast themselves during the summertime because paying that is less important than sending money to international management. Right. And their phones get shut off and the elevator doesn't work. So everybody just walks up and down the stairs and goes, good exercise. So they've got these awesome buildings, but they still wind up getting into that degraded things don't work scenario and saying, oh, we're going to get our jobs done regardless. Exactly. Well, you got a $10 million building, so you didn't have to say regardless. Right? Exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so even though it's my turn to answer the question. Okay, fine. I'll answer the question and then we'll <laughs> revisit. You're not cheating. Your answer. <laughs> All right. So go ahead. What's the question that we're going here? Once you were on staff or, or in the CR, generally, generally, how did it go? Okay, so for me, um, <clears throat> now in my story, I joined staff earlier on in life and then joined the CR later on in life. So I joined staff when I was 12. Um, I joined the CR. I was 22 when I joined the CR. So I kind of have two different answers to these questions, and I'm not sure um, how we want to address that. But So when I joined staff, I already discussed how we joined staff, and then we had a, 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 had a series of courses I had to do. To, I had to finish in order to um, qualify to go to fly. And I already covered uh, that part of the story. Once I got to flag, the next three years of my life were pretty awesome. 
And I think that's just an important message. I really want kind of Scientology watchers or people trying to understand why people stay in Scientology or what it's like for people growing up in Scientology. For a kid growing up in Scientology, it can be pretty freaking awesome. Um, and I'm just reminded by some of the stories. I listened to Leah Remini's book, audiobook last night, and um, she, she does a really good job actually explaining what parts of Scientology were very beneficial for her growing up. And it completely resonated with me. Mm. Um, you're not treated as a child. And, and not in a parenting way, like, oh, you're such a grown up. No, I mean, that's still being treated like a child. You're literally treated as an equal, a complete equal as anyone else. Um, your education is irrelevant. Your formal education is irrelevant. You know, your performance on standardized testing is irrelevant. Your resume is irrelevant. Your experience is irrelevant because everyone is treated as if you've been around for 4 trillion or however, you know, <laughs> years. And we don't give a shit um, how old you are, whether the state says you can drink or whether the state calls you an adult. It's totally relevant. Scientology rewrites its rules, has its own set of mores. And um, the truth is you can really thrive in that environment. Um, because my experience is that in public school and in society at large, um, you, you're really, uh, there's a limit put on how, how much you can reach, how much you can do. I mean, even, I don't want to rail against the public education system here, but even the idea of at a certain age, you can only, you're only supposed to be at this grade level and you can only be as, as good as the people next to you. And you're just surrounded by people who are the same age as you are. And there's not a real opportunity for growth in that structured system. And I know I, I struggled with it. Um, <clears throat> so when I went to flag, uh, it was me, it was my brother and, um, one of our friends, Edward DiMartino, and we moved into our own apartment and all of a sudden we're managing our own schedule and we're responsible for ourselves. And, um, How old were you then? So I was, uh, I was either 12 or 13. I, I can't remember exactly. It, either 12 or 13, right? 12 was when we started in the Philadelphia org. I don't remember exactly how long it took for us to finish those courses. <clears throat> um, and actually it was just amazing. So uh, there was a lot of freedom. Um, it, it's funny cause there's freedoms and there's, and there's, there's limitations. So the limitation is, could I do whatever I want whenever I wanted? Nope. You know, on a, on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning when we're, um, uh, doing menial labor, um, were there times when I can imagine there were times when we'd be taking the bus into the base, into flag first thing in the morning, you know, eight thirty on a Saturday morning. And I'm looking at all the cars on the street thinking, you know, those people can literally go do anywhere, go anywhere they want right now and do anything they want. Those guys could go to the beach and do nothing right now. I can't even fucking imagine what it would be like to go to the beach and do nothing right now. Right. And it's funny. It's actually slightly embarrassing when I look back and I realize I'm having these kind of thoughts. Those are not normal thoughts for a child to be having. Like thinking, Oh my God, that person could literally go to the movie, go, go to the mall and watch a movie right now if they wanted to. I can't even imagine having that ability. Like, it's, it's disturbing and troubling right now to realize I was having those thoughts at that time and it didn't feel like a trap. It didn't feel like yeah, a prison. Yeah. You know what I mean? It felt like this is normal because I'm doing something that's so important and I've committed to this. And, um, but normal kids don't have to have thoughts like that, right? So, <laughs> True. Um, but even though, even though I can look back on that three-year period and I can look at specific examples that sound disturbing like that, um, when I look back on that period, it was some of the most fun I've had in my life, um, made some of the best friends I've ever had in my life. And, um, and I think a lot of it is due to the camaraderie. Like you mentioned the camaraderie on the ship, the three year period that I spent at flag, it's almost hard to put into words how close, um, the group of people I was there with became, cause I don't have anything to compare it to. And the, the, the best thing I can compare it to is special forces, which sounds like a funny analogy, but to understand the sea org, you have to stop thinking about it as, as a religion. And you have to start thinking of it as, as, um, the military. Absolutely. Completely. Absolutely. And when I was at flag, we were uh, there during a time when we were training as a group who we were being educated to believe we were the best of the best of all of Scientology. And that um, the training evolution that we were a part of, the purpose of it was to get rid of any old previous false ideas, false operating basis, false um, technology, false versions of the technology. Um, uh, we were called the Young Turks, right? 
um, which is kind of a revolutionary term. And <clears throat> we were, we'd had sp special meetings with the chairman of the board where he would basically instill in us that we were the vanguard of all of Scientology. We were the best of the best, no one else. There had never been a training evolution like this. Um, there had be never been such attention to detail like this. Now there's been two other training <laughs> evolutions since then where they were told the exact same thing and that everyone who'd been trained in Scientology before them were total pieces of shit who never understood one word of Scientology. But like, no, literally, Ch David Miscavige even, you know, got up there in front of a thousand of us out of our trainees and basically said, he said, um, you're either in the loop or you're out of the loop and I am the loop. <laughs> When he said it, we were like, oh, you're such a badass. I'll take this guy, is so awesome. <laughs> but that's because we were in the loop. We're like, we want to be in the fucking loop, right? <laughs> and, um, and he even said, when you guys go back to your orgs, you've got a special line to me. You've got, you know, the bat phone. You just pick it up. You, you know, he wasn't literally like, you'll get me on the phone. But he was like, I've got your back um, <clears throat> because you guys have my back. And, man, I mean, looking back on it, it's like, Yes, there's a big mind control aspect to that. There's a huge manipulation aspect to that. Um, but it felt great at the time, you know? Like, I was loyal to David Miscavige above, above any other. Um, we didn't really make a distinction between LRH and David Miscavige. Um, but if we had to, it would have been David Miscavige because he's alive. Um, by that sheer fact, like, I, I even had this conversation with some people when if, like, if I was having a conversation with someone where I was pushing or discussing an order that came from David Miscavige, and if they tried to say that this um, subject that we were discussing was somehow contrary to uh, something LRH said or wrote at the time, I would be like, who's running the show? Are you going to sit here and argue with the guy who's running the show? And not like, oh, man, do me a favor because the guy running the show's on my back. Like, no, I, I consider myself an emissary of David Miscavige. Right. Um, even more so than LRH. Um... So I've gone, uh, it might be a little bit of a tangent there. The, the experience itself for me, I felt at the time and even now I still feel was very, very positive. But because I did it at such a young age, because I was being um, given an opportunity to grow, you can make the argument that um, I, I would have done better if I had the opportunity to grow in other environments. You know, I don't know what other environments would have provided me that opportunity because uh, I just don't know. Well, that's... That yeah, I mean, you can always say that. You can always say, well, if this had happened, that... But what happened is what happened. Right. You ended up being what you are today based on your experiences that you did have. Right. And it's the same with me. I mean, oftentimes people say, well, how do you feel about... Well, you know, I don't regret my life. I don't regret... I, I mean, certainly I can look back and go... Would I have been better off if this had happened or would I have been better off if that had happened or if I'd never joined the CEO or if I, my parents had never gone into Scientology or this or that? Uh, yeah, possibly. But right. that's not what happened. So here I am and I am where I am today because of what's happened to me and because of my inherent native approach to life or whatever, you know, good, bad or indifferent as that may be. I can't look back and go, oh, this is all being terrible and, you know, woe is me for the terrible thing and things that I've been through and where I find myself today. Right. Because I consider that a lot of the things that I experienced and the, the people that I met and the things that I ended up doing are pretty cool. Right. I mean, I've been all over the world. I've met all sorts of people. I've done all sorts of things. I have experience in all sorts of different areas. And maybe I don't have a degree, but I have a lot of things that I have learned in over a long period of time that I consider very valuable attributes to living life. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, um... <clears throat> I guess sometimes I wonder how my feelings about that time I spent um, in such an insular situation, how my feelings, uh, I spent some time thinking about how my feelings about uh, the time I spent in that scenario differ from someone else who maybe was, well, let's say, someone else might go, oh, I wasted the prime years of my life. I don't know, 25 to 50 or whatever. And now it's all meaningless. 
I don't have to have that conversation with myself <laughs> because right. this was happening to me during an age when otherwise I would have been in high school. I don't think people usually look back on their high school years and go, oh, those were the best years of my life. You know what I mean? Um, and so I probably avoided getting into an awful lot of trouble that I might have otherwise gotten into. I guess these are some of the thoughts that I have. You know, time that I spent in Scientology, if I had, if I, if I had just been in the public education system or gone the traditional route, I don't know how it would have gone, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Where was I at in my actual answer there? Um, you said you spent three years training, and that was some of the best time of your life. It was, and it and it had to do. It had to okay the camaraderie. It was because of the camaraderie. Um, and so let, let me give you some more details on what day to day life or what our schedule consisted of. So, you know, we would do uh, our org. Uh, Philadelphia Org was not ma didn't make enough money to send any money to flag to pay for our room and board. It was six of us training from Philadelphia, so we had to do work study, which meant nights and weekends. You were basically uh, you did you did hard labor, right? You, um, now it didn't have to be hard labor. It could be you worked in the restaurants, you worked in the laundry rooms, you helped do renovations on the buildings on the base, you um, helped um, move Sea Org members' birthing from one room to another room. So you know, as a thirteen year old and fourteen year old kid. I was doing demolition. I was doing HVAC. Um, uh, you know, I was doing um, uh, you know real renovations work. Uh, the, so the demolition, you know, he heavy equipment, heavy machinery. We were moving refrigerators and stoves and beds up and down stairs. Uh, technically, if we weren't considered religious volunteers, this all would have violated uh, the child labor laws. Um, well, no, it still does violate the child labor laws. Okay, God, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't swear to it, but <laughs> it Mike Rinder said it. <laughs> so, okay, so... Yeah, that's one of the laws you can't... Child labor and the, the treatment of children doesn't get exempted by religious... hiding behind the cloak of the First Amendment. I'll take your word for it. If that's true, then the church uh, should be taking a task for this eventually. Absolutely. Um, and so, did I have any formal education of any kind whatsoever during these three years? No. Um, the rules that were in place for Sea Org members who were minors, there were rules in place that those guys had to at least do you know, a, a few hours of schooling a week. Most Sea Org members didn't do it. Um, those rules were not in place for non-Sea Org members. I was not a Sea Org member. I was living at FLAG. I was living with the Sea Org members. I was eating with the Sea Org members. I was on the same schedule as the Sea Org members, but I wasn't a Sea Org member. So those rules didn't apply to me. So you didn't go to school at all? Not at all. Not at all. I had zero. Um, nor did I want to. Um, but it certainly wasn't. School was considered, the way Seerg members and staff members thought about school, was an archaic um, requirement that society, WOG society, WOG is the N-word for non-Scientologists. <laughs> That's how I describe it. It, it, an archaic wog um, concept that uh, was only a, a bother, an interference, because the state decided it was their right to intervene and you know make parents send their kids to school. Like otherwise, it had zero value. The education you got in Scientology is what mattered. The education of within Scientology principles and on the job training. I mean, the, the view here, and I don't disagree with this. On the job training, actual real world experience. Mm -hmm is far more valuable um, and more valued by employers um, than anything you can do in a classroom. And so you had two factors, uh, two factors running here. One, that Scientology believes you've already learned everything there is to learn in your past lives and you just need to basically do it again and you'll pick it up quickly or whatever. I mean, th that's part of why public education, like, oh, education, everyone's already been educated. That's so, yeah, but you can't read and write. Well, that's different. You have to be literate. Well, right? yeah, but you're saying, Public education is like you learned it all in early lifetimes. I mean, that's that's sort that's a sort of a true statement. Except, I there's no Scientologists. I, I mean, unfortunately, there are a lot of Scientologists who are effectively illiterate because they don't go to school or they it's given such low priority. But I don't think anybody believes that you just automatically know how to read and write because you've lived early a lifetime. No, I certainly agree that nobody has that idea. Um, <clears throat> but it's just, as far as the lack of emphasis on education, absolutely, in general, it's that the, the data is already native to you at some on some level. 
So you can recover it by doing, you can recover it quickly by studying, but you don't need a degree in anything to do anything. I mean, agreed? I, I, I agree with you, but you, I mean, the sort of illogic of that is exposed by the, yeah, well then how come you don't know how to read and write? Right. <laughs> I mean, like, the, I mean, I agree with you that on the job training is, is, has more benefit to the real world than book study does. However, I also think that, that a lot of people have negated the subject of, of, uh, you know, studying literature or what other people think. Like the humanities. The humanities. And, and Scientologists tend to assign that absolutely no value whatsoever. And I think it has, in, in the overall scheme of things, I think it has far more value than is, it is granted in Scientology. Totally, totally. And I'm not advocating for why people shouldn't go to school. This is right. just, this was the mindset of why education, for any sort of formal education was completely negated. Um, was just these two factors. One, you've already learned everything anyway before, so whatever, whatever you want to do with that piece of information, I don't know. And, um, and just the other thing, that the only thing that mattered in the world at large was um, Scientology and how fast Scientology could expand and how fast you can audit people and move them up the bridge and that um, you know what the world needs is people delivering Scientology. It doesn't need engineers. It doesn't need doctors. It doesn't need this. And so any, any of these other things that you might learn in school, history, math, you don't need to be a mathematician to be a Scientologist. You know, it was what you're learning here is all, is all that matters, right? Yeah. Okay, so I spent from the age of 14 to 15, I worked from 8 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, um, 365 days a year. I went one whole year without a day off. Um, and again, I say that, and you know, that's not natural. That's not usual. Some people might even say that's not healthy. Um, didn't feel that way at the time. It, it was actually, uh, it was still a great time, even, even that whole year without having a day off was a wonderful time. Now I'm sure I can sit here and think of particular days or weeks that were just God awful that I was like, this cannot last. But I, I think my point here is just that the excitement that we had and the camaraderie that we had at that time, um, made all of that. Okay. You know what I mean? Like I'm not necessarily sitting here saying that's right or that's wrong. I'm just pointing out those were the extreme conditions at that time. Right. And whatever we had going on in our heads, why this was all great and justified, totally counteracted any, um, any objections I might have had to why do we have to work this hard? Why yeah. do we have to work this long? I, I agree. Right. And, and, and that works. It, what happens is, though, after years of it, it Oh, totally. Doesn't that that enthusiasm <laughs> tends to wane? No, totally, and that's why um, I think one message I'll repeat as I tell my story is how I've been very fortunate in dodging certain types of bullets, and this what we're talking about right now is an example. I was working on that schedule under those stresses during a time when we were all rallying around a very common and strong goal, right, and purpose, and that strong purpose that we were all working. Um, on, uh, counteracted the, the stresses at that time. But you can only run that for a certain amount of time. You can only run that until the, you reach the goal, which is all thousand outdoor trainees finished their training and, and were sent back to their orgs all on the same day. And it was a big success story. And it was something we could all, um, you know, it was the end of that chapter. And it was like, we were the best. We were awesome. We did it. We made the goal. And, and just, you know, as a part of this story, I wasn't just, I wasn't just a small part of this evolution. I was the first staff member in the entire world to finish the training program that I was working on. And I was, uh, had a lot of praise heaped upon me at that time. I was considered quite a badass amongst all of the outward trainees. I was, um, I was put in charge of all of the miners. Like I, I was in charge of all of the miners. There was about a hundred of us, um, <clears throat> from all over the world, almost every country in the world. And after I finished my training program, I was part of the team that was in charge of getting everyone else through their training program. And we were answering directly to RTC, the Religious Technology Center that David Miscavige is in charge of, 
we were working directly with the Commodore's messengers, um, who are basically, let's just say, um, aside from RTC, are the most senior people in the church. Um, and so the whole that whole three year period of my life uh, was considered a very uh, big success story. Mm -hmm. right? So, but but that's different though. When I say I dodged a bullet, if I was a Sea Org member though, I would have gone back to my Sea Org org. And I would have felt like I was riding this big high and then I would get that plunged right into day-to-day -day life of a Sea Org member where you're either a great person or a piece of shit, depending on your stats for that week. Or day. Or day. And it very, very quickly would have gotten into the, oh shit, this is not going to last. This can't, this can't go on forever. This, um, I can't put up with this every day. But I dodged a bullet because I wasn't a Sea Org member. And instead I went back to Philadelphia Org. And we went back to that org being the badasses. We weren't there to take shit from anyone. And we weren't there to take orders from our executive director. And we weren't there to listen to whatever our seniors had to say because we knew best what needed to get done. And if anyone wanted to give us shit, they should be worried that they were on our bad side. Like this right. is the attitude we went back with. And to be honest, even at that, so I was 15 years old when I went back to Philadelphia. And even then, I can look back on this period and, and give examples of things that sound terrible, <laughs> you know? But on a whole, it was still a positive experience for me. And, you know, even though we're basically child laborers at this point, um, there's something to be said for work ethic. <laughs> there's something to be said for having your normal be, I work 100 hours a week and uh, only expect a couple hundred dollars of pay. Because the truth is at that point, you're not working for the money. The pay is like, as, as a staff member I would have said, you can pay me nothing. I mean, I'm not working for the money. I do need to eat, you know, but, uh, and that's all. I just think it's another important thing for people to understand is that um, uh, we're not, we weren't there for the money. We were there for the mission. And so you can put up with so much. There are so many themes that get like these recounting these sort of experiences of your early time or whether it's early or not they encapsulate concepts that speak to the whole topic of scientology and its uh hold over people if you will or why why scientologists act the way they do and and there's three of them that are in this the stuff that we've been talking about today that are like really key, probably the bottom line of everything. One is the camaraderie and the us against the world mentality. And we, we have to stick together and have, have each other's backs and almost the, the worse the experience, the more, the greater the camaraderie is that gets generated subsequently. And the feeling that, those are your people, and these are the people that you need to maintain your friendships and loyalty to. And two is, I'm right. You just said that thing like, you know, well, I know I'm right. And that is, a, that is a, a theme that starts at the very beginning of the subject of studying Scientology, where you come to believe that you are right. And if you're not absolutely certain about what it is that may confront you right at this second, you know that you have answers and that the answers are contained in the tech mm -hmm. and that you are absolutely right about everything, mm -hmm. not just a few things, everything. And if you're not totally certain about it just yet, it's just a matter of going and looking it up and then you will be right about everything. Right. And that, that is a, a, an overriding theme that, that goes, stretches all throughout the whole subject of Scientology and its hold on people and why do they act the way they do and why, why can't they see things? Like, why don't they see that, the, that this stuff is weird or that what they're doing is strange or that they're not really hitting it off with the rest of the world? Well, because they're right about everything. And, I, and I, the third thing that I think is, is important is 
the idea that there is this greater purpose and that it transcends everything that could be wrong. Like there is these justifications and explanations for why this isn't important or that isn't important or it doesn't matter or whatever. And part of it's the tech, part of it's this, part of it. But the other part of it is in the overall scheme of things, none of those things are important. Being able to go to the movies, it's irrelevant. Having a nice desk, it, do it doesn't matter. It's not going to impact the ability to achieve what really is important, which is saving the planet. Right. And I, I think that that kind of, if you, if you were trying to figure out what the mindset of Scientologists is, to one degree or another, every Scientologist is inculcated into those concepts. And the closer you get to the top or the core of Scientology, the Sea Org, and then ultimately the international headquarters, the stronger those beliefs are. Like the people that most buy into those concepts are the ones that make it to those places. Right. And that's where you find, and then it's a self-perpetuating machine of, I believe this, so you must believe it. If you wavering from it, then you're going to quickly get found out. Right. And either you're gone or you get brought back inside that bubble of, of this is how we think. Right. And it, 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 you know, I look back and I go, wow, the, the inculcation of people into that mindset is really what the prison of belief is right. in Scientology. Right, right, right. Absolutely. I know I just got off into like, a, <clears throat> no, it's fine. I think people watching these interviews, you know, love to understand, um, uh, our thoughts on the subject. So, um, and as far as inculcating people into beliefs, you know, our time at Flag, my time at Flag, uh, left me with the impression that David Miscavige was just um, the uh, one of the greatest dudes in the world. Um, there was no worship aspect going on there. Um, and just while we're on the subject, my whole experience in Scientology has never led me to any sort of a worship aspect of L. Ron Hubbard. That's always something that's hard to explain. How do you have a religion without any worship or belief in some sort of creator or whatever. So we didn't worship David Miscavige, but uh, just the most perfect example of what a Scientologist or a Sea Org member could be. Hands down. Um, I've never personally had a conversation with David Miscavige. Uh, only seen him on stage. Even if I was in the same room at him, it was always on stage. I don't think I've ever been within 100 feet of David Miscavige. But he would brief us at our meetings frequently. Um, I never had an experience that left me with a negative, a bad taste in my mouth about David Miscavige. Right. And also realized that growing up um, in a, on a sea or base at this time, it's absolutely true that physical violence is not frowned upon. It's a non-issue. Um, so now at Flag, physical, we'll just let the phone ring. Physical actual fights were very rare. Um, but that's because Everyone had perfected the art of absolutely going berserk at someone without striking them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> screaming was an art form and being able to do it without coming off as physically threatening was considered like the ultimate skill. How do you scream at someone without physically threatening them? And um, it's funny to be talking about this, but I perfected that skill. <laughs> And, um, you know, screaming is a good motivator, um, especially if you're not physically threatening someone. Things go downhill pretty quickly when you physically threaten someone. So even though there's flag orders, flag orders are policies LRH wrote specifically for the Sea Org, that say it is totally okay to get into fights. It is, it is of no concern or consequence to anyone if two people come to blows um, in the course of doing their job. The only offense would be if you hurt the guy too much. That he couldn't do his job. That he couldn't do his job. You were denying the Sea Org that, that person's service until he got better. That was the only... that. Was. So I didn't... So even these things about David Miscavige yelling or, or beating or whatever. Um, as a Sea Org member, people don't give a shit about that. I know. The, the media wants to go, oh my God, how come you didn't call the police? 
when Anderson Cooper had the four ex-wives up there, how come no one called the police? It was, I, I was, I'm watching this and I go, how do you explain that? Like, it would never even occur to someone to call the police. Like, it's not even the tenth thought you have. That thought doesn't exist, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, but you have Anderson Cooper saying, if, if I observed this in the office place, I would, you're like, yeah, of course you would. You don't get it. We don't, we're in a different world. Right. We don't, we don't operate by your rules, you know? It's not even Probably. about, it's not even, we have to protect the church. It's not even that. It's, it's not. No. <laughs> it's that we, the police are irrelevant. The pol that's for other people. That's not for us. Right. And, um, <clears throat> So where else am I going with this? Um, oh, the um, in, uh, inculcating someone into a prison of belief. Based on my first hand, even though I never spoke to David Miscavige, even though, you know, that direct interaction didn't occur. Based on my first hand experience, nobody, you could never convince me that there was anything wrong with anything David Miscavige said or did. Like, it, I don't even know what the standard of, of evidence would have would have been to change my mind or convince me that there was anything wrong with anything David Miscavige had ever said or done since the day he entered Scientology. Right. Um, and it wasn't like, there was no cognitive dissonance either. It wasn't like, oh, I've seen all these terrible things, but I have to tuck them away and explain them away. No. Never had a bad experience. It was never exposed to bad data. Um, and, he, and, and, and here's something. His, his whole personality, his whole presence is so perfectly stage managed in Scientology at these international events, when, when he comes to flag and hosts graduation, when he um, walks through an, an org doing an inspection with 20 people, he's not angry David Miscavige walking through. He's the benevolent, kind, friendly, observant, caring David Miscavige. And I think, I can't, I can't stress the concept of stage managing um, his persona to all Scientologists. Um, later on down the line, when I started to, um, expose myself to information on the internet about some people's experiences and talking to you and, um, talking to other people, I would have conversations with some of my colleagues from this time who trained during this time. And they would be like, you know what? All I know is what I know of David Miscavige. Right. And, um, sorry, uh, e even I'll name drop, uh, Dan O'Connor, senior CS, Kansas city org, senior case supervisor. He tells me this anecdote of how he was on course in one of the buildings called the Coachman. And uh, this was during the time when a lot of work was being done on the state of clear and whether people were clear or not. And, you know, David Miscavige just walked up and started having a chit chat conversation with Dan and was like really attentive and he really cared and he was really interested. And when, when Dan answered the question, David Miscavige gave him a really good acknowledgement and, um, and he, he really valued Dan's input. <laughs> And I'm like, well, there you go, Dan. There you go. All this other shit doesn't matter. Because he was a really nice fucking guy when you spoke to him. Thumbs up, Dan. You're a critical thinker. <laughs> but, you know, like, Dan's never been exposed on a first-hand basis to anything that would um, result in a negative impression of David Miscavige. It's, it's only what people have said. And when you feel like your first-hand experience trumps anything anyone else could ever tell you then you can't really have your mind changed and and i just i i, I keep stressing this point a lot because his persona is so stage managed it is so hard to convince people that their direct interaction with david miscavige is not a typical interaction with david right. miscavige right well, it I, is so hard i have that experience with my brother right. when my brother flew from australia with those you know nine other people to come and attack me in the parking lot of the doctor's office. Yeah. I eventually got to talk to my brother when he was trying, when he was trying to prevent me from leaving and taking the car, the keys out of the car. And it was just him and me inside the car at that point. I mm -hmm. said, Andrew, listen, do you understand what is going on? Have you ever heard of the word enuement? Do you, do you have any idea of what, what Miscavige what his life is really like or how he really is and what really goes on and what happens to people around him, et cetera, et cetera. And his response was, I don't care. He, he deserves 10 times as much as he's got. Anything he does is, is forgiven. Look at all the good that he's doing. And that is, this is his 
older brother telling him, stop, listen to me for a second. You don't know what's really going on. You just don't know. And that went right by his head. It just, it, it, it there wasn't even a flicker of maybe I should listen to this. Mm -hmm. It was just the instant, oh no, he deserves, I mean, if, if he had a thousand times more than what he has right now, it wouldn't be enough. Right. It's just, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a very, you're right, it's a very, very stage managed um, image that gets put forth. But then when you get to the places where that image isn't maintained, like at the int base, right. where he acts like he really is, the people there are the ones who are so into the, have so bought into this, the idea of what needs to be done and what's important that they've got a whole different justification to explain that. Right. And it's almost like you said, police beating people. So what? That's not important. In the overall scheme of things, I understand why he gets so upset and is always beating on people. <laughs> because everybody else is fucking up. And right. he's the only one that's getting anything done and he's saving the planet single-handedly and we're all an impediment to him. Right. And that's the, that is literally the mindset that you get into that everybody has that is very, very hard to break out of. Right. Right, right. Makes sense. So to finish answering this question, and I don't know how we're doing on time, but maybe we're rolling a little bit longer. Um, you know, it says, once you're on staff in the SO, generally, how did it go? Um, I think I've, I've covered that a bit. Day-to-day -day life. Day-to-day -day life is, um, you know, this is so roughly from the ages of 13 to 15 here, right? Um, waking up at 8, 8.30 in the morning, going to an exercise muster. So that's where everyone lines up and does roll call, very military-like. Um, then you exercise for 30 minutes, which is just jogging and doing whatever. Um, then you shower, get on the buses, go into the base, eat breakfast in 10 or 15 minutes, um, go to course. Uh, you're on course from nine o'clock in the morning until, well, we were on work study. So nine o'clock in the morning until six, 6.30, then you have dinner, then you're doing heavy labor until 10 o'clock at night. Then you have a 10 o'clock muster, at, or 10, you know, then you have a muster. There's like three or four musters during the day to make sure everyone has not, no one's escaped, right? <laughs> and, but, but at the time we didn't, that's not how we thought of musters. But God, you know, no, we absolutely were aware of the fact that musters were done to make sure everyone was there. Right. If someone was missing, it was a discipline problem. It wasn't, oh my God, circle the dogs, you know. Um, but that's how you found out if someone was missing. Right. Is they missed, if two musters in a row, people are looking for your ass, <laughs> right? I mean, you missed one muster, someone's looking for you. Um, so, you know, it was eight o'clock in the morning, 10, and again, the muster is at 1020. That's not go to bed at 1020. That's everyone's still dressed and in lines and doing roll call at 1020 at night. Then, I don't know, you, know, you had a certain amount of time to get ready for bed and then it was lights out. And again, lights out is one of those things where it, it's enforced. It's like you've got, you know, security guards walking around, banging on your door. Why isn't your light out? And you're like, dude, you know that I work 15 hours a day, right? Like, could I take a minute to chill? It's like, no, <laughs> you can't take a minute to chill. Um, and so let's see, so that went on. And again, um, I, I want to mention the, the, the special forces thing again, um, because I, I think using a right analogy is what allows people to, to understand the mindset of something, right? The special forces guys, could you imagine a special force guy com complaining about how much it sucks being in a swamp, a cold swamp at night? No, fuck no. That's what makes them special forces right. guys. Well, the, oh, the, the K rations were like really <laughs> shitty today. <laughs> or, or sometimes we don't make enough money. When you think about special forces guys, you don't think they're not in it for the money, right? They're not in it for the money. Sea Org members and staff members absolutely think of themselves that way. Um, there was a period where every other week, if, st if stats were up, they would show a movie to everyone. Um, you know, movies like Apollo 13, where you've got a small number of people against all odds doing hugely amazing things, um, was the message that would resonate with us. I remember we were all watching Apollo 13, and there's this one line where Ed Harris goes, Failure is not an option. The whole fucking room erupted in applause and cheers. Not a typical response that you'd get at a movie theater. 
Like it was spontaneous because that's what we were being educated to believe. There was nothing, failure is not an option. And we're right. like, oh, this guy, you know. Um, you know, any movies that had special forces movies was kind of like, you know, we watched movies, we're like, oh, that's us. You know, it's, it sounds a little cheesy and it sounds a little embarrassing to say, but that is how staff members who, you know, train, do, who have gone through these training evolutions that are being run by David Miscavige. Um, that's how you are thought to think about yourself. You're the special forces of Scientology and there's no one on this earth bad than you know, you know, that, that, that kind of idea. Um, so even though we've only covered, I've only answered the question from the viewpoint of when I joined staff, not the Sea Org, I think that's probably enough for this question or it's going to go on forever. Plus it's a chronological. It's, it's, it's probably enough for this video. Okay. It's going to go on forever. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. A lot more to come. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel or like the video uh, if you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next time.